Morning, everyone. Today, we will talk about the dimensionality reduction techniques. We will focus on some of the most widely used methods, TCA, TSNE, and UMAP, compare their differences, and talk about their application scenarios. So in data analysis, especially machine learning, to catch useful information and get a more accurate result, we normally add as many features as possible at first. But after a certain point, the performance of the model will decrease with the increasing number of features. This is known as uh, the curse of dimensionality. And uh, dimensionality reduction is the process of reducing the number of features to the most relative ones. So here is an example of dimensionality reduction for data visualization purpose. What we have is uh, 2,940 cellular images, so 2940 rows. For each image, we pre-processed the images using convolutional neural networks and extracted 1,280 features, so 1,280 columns. And what we want to see is based on the morphology of the cells, which cells are similar and which cells are different, and whether they will fall into clusters. Here, we are using a 2D projection, which is the image we can see on the right here. For dimensionality reduction, here is how we can define it. It is the process of reducing the dimensionality of the feature space to get a set of low dimensional features. And it's often used in data compression to reduce time and storage space. For example, recently, all tech companies are investing heavily in video compression techniques for the next generation of stream gaming. Another application is noise reduction as we may have heard of the garbage in, garbage out theory. We want our input to the model to be good quality. So we need to remove redundant and uh, irrelevant features. And the visualization is another application because uh, we humans are limited to 3D. So if we can reduce the dimensionality to 2D or 3D, then we can get some insights by analyzing these patterns. There are actually quite a lot of techniques for dimensionality reduction. For example, the feature selection methods like Pearson's correlation and the feature projection methods like matrix factorization, manifold learning, and some recent deep learning based models. But today, we will focus on PCA, TSNE, and UMAP. First, let's talk about PCA, Principal Component Analysis. So PCA is a linear method to reduce the features from high dimensional space to a lower dimensional space, for example, to 2D or 3D, and at the same time, retain most of the information. Again, let's use the images that we mentioned earlier as an example. So each image have uh, uh, 1280 features, uh, which means uh, 1280 values. We want to use uh, two or three values uh, to represent this image. The two or three values are called principal components. And by linear, we mean something similar to this. So how do we calculate the principal components? Here is a visualization of the process, and we are using two dimensions as an example. Assume each blue dot represents a data point, and the red dots on the line are their projections. Geometrically speaking, principal components represent the directions of the data that explain a maximum amount of values, which means in this case, the line that captures the most information of the data, which means the line in which the red dots are the most spread out. So we can see it's approximately the line that matches the, the purple marks. We call this the eigenvector. The second principal component is calculated in the same way with two conditions. One, it is uncorrelated with the first principal component, and two, it accounts for the next highest variance. So here is the line which is particular to the first principal component, and we don't have a choice for this one, so which is this line here. And when it comes to more dimensions, uh, we use a similar strategy. 
first uh, we find that the first uh, principal component, which will be a hyperplane in this case because uh, it's more than three dimensions. We then find that the next uh, principal component, uh, which is uh, perpendicular to the first one. The third uh, principal component uh, will be perpendicular to both the first uh, and the second ones, and so on. The last uh, principal component is always uh, the remaining perpendicular. And the next, uh, we can make a plot and then see how much each uh, principal component explains the proportion of the total variance. So in a simpler way, how much each principal component explains our data. So here is a plot of the PCA result using the previous cellular image example. We can see the first principal component explains the most, and the second principal component explains the second highest. If this is for visualization purpose, we can then take the first two or three principal components, use them as the x, y, and z axis, and plot the data. If PCA is an initial step for the data analysis, we will use this plot to decide until which component we will take for further analysis or modeling. So we have uh, talked about uh, PCA. Is it great? Well, one problem is uh, PCA always tries to preserve the global structure of the data because uh, we use all the data points for PCA, but uh, it may not be good for visualization. As we can see here, the clusters uh, are not uh, spread out evenly. So what can we do? Well, we can try to use another technique, TSNE, to visualize the same data set. So TSNE is a nonlinear dimensionality reduction technique. It's always used for visualization because it tries to preserve the local structure of the data and form really nice clusters. So here is a very brief overview of how TSNE works. So I will skip some details here. We will start with uh, the SNE part of TSNE, which is a uh, stochastic neighbor embedding. Assume we have three different classes and uh, each class has four data points represented by red, blue, and the orange color. We randomly pick one point here and uh, calculate uh, the Euclidean distance between this point and all the other points. We then generate a Gaussian distribution here with the mean at the data point we randomly picked here. We then project each point of the Gaussian distribution uh, using the distance as the x-axis. So here. Once we get uh, the projected values, uh, which is the probability distribution, we normalize them because uh, the blue data points uh, are more spread so their Gaussian distribution will be flatter. So the projection values, uh, the y-axis values, uh, like uh, all the project, uh, projections here, will be smaller. And finally, we get uh, the normalized uh, probability distributions. We then create a low dimensional space using student t distribution and uh, randomly place the data points to the low dimensional space. Uh, here is uh, where the t in TSNE comes from. We then minimize the KL divergence between the high and low dimensional probability distributions. KL divergence quantifies uh, the distance between two distributions. What we want is uh, for these two distributions uh, to be as close as possible. This means uh, similar data points in the high dimensional space can be mapped uh, to similar points uh, in the low dimensional space. The method we use uh, to minimize the KL divergence is called uh, gradient descent. This is a technique to get the minimum of any function in an iterative process. Here is a visualization of uh, how gradient descent uh, works uh, for mapped data points in the low dimensional space. And one of the important uh, hyperparameter of TSNE is uh, perplexity. Uh, perplexity is more or less the expected number of neighbors uh, for our central point. Here we can see how perplexity affects our TSNE results. So as we increase uh, the perplexity value 
our data points uh, start to form nice clusters. But if we increase it further, the clusters uh, will start to mix uh, with each other. So for example, here we see the purple and the green and uh, uh, blue and the red uh, clusters, uh, they start to mix uh, with each other. So is TSNI great? Well, kind of, if we compare TSNI to PCA again, TSNI reduces the dimensionality by projecting data points from high dimensional distribution to low uh, dimensional distribution. This means uh, the X, Y, and the distance in the plot doesn't mean the absolute distance. So only the distances uh, within a cluster are meaningful, but not the distances uh, between clusters. So here, uh, we can't really compare the three clusters uh, in the final embedding. For example, the blue-orange clusters uh, are closer. This doesn't really mean they are closer to each other in the original space. TSNI is also very sensitive to the perplexity hyperparameters. So uh, we have already seen that earlier. In fact, uh, we can get uh, very different results uh, if we use a different perplexity value. Another main complaint of uh, TSNI is its uh, computational cost because TSNI use all data points for gradient descent. Uh, so it's very slow for larger data set. So in 2018, UMAP was published to solve some of these problems. UMAP is very similar to TSNI, but much quicker and uh, preserve more global structures. Here, what I mean is uh, more global structures, uh, not all global structures. Here, we will look at the differences between TSNI and UMAP and see why UMAP is faster. First, uh, UMAP doesn't apply normalization to either high or low dimensional probabilities. This uh, dramatically reduces the computational cost, uh, especially in the high dimensional space. Secondly, UMAP uses a graph Laplacian to assign initial locations for mapped data points rather than random initialization like TSNI. This creates a rough estimation of the mapped data points. This can save some time. And another point is uh, UMAP use uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent, SGD, rather than gradient descent. I have skipped a lot of math and the details here because of time limit. For example, UMAP uses a uh, uh, cross entropy as the cost of function instead of KL divergence to preserve some global features uh, in the data. If anyone is interested in the math behind them, you can go to this website for a detailed explanation. So compared to TSNI, UMAP has more hyperparameters to tune. The most important ones uh, are the nearest neighbors and uh, the minimum distance. Nearest neighbors uh, is similar to perplexity in TSNI and will affect uh, the balance between local and global structures. Minimum distance uh, controls uh, how tightly you map packs points within a cluster. We can see here what happens if we tune these two hyperparameters. From the first row, we can see when the nearest neighbor is small, the data is very disconnected and scattered throughout the space. As we increase the nearest neighbor, UMAP manages to see more of the overall structure of the data and glue more data points together. But if we continue increasing nearest the neighbor, UMAP will focus more and more on the overall structure and uh, lose uh, some of the finer local structures. What we see is uh, the blue and uh, red clusters start to merge together. From the second row, uh, we see as we increase uh, minimum distance, data points within each cluster are pushed apart into more general features. This gives us a better overarching overview of the data, but at the loss of some topological structures. So this time is UMAP grid then. Well, it may perform better on more complex data sets, and it is definitely quicker than TSNI. But let's look at this example. This is a data set uh, with a dense, tight cluster inside uh, of a wide, uh, sparse cluster. Here's the result of TSNI, and uh, here's the result of UMAP. 
and we can see UMAP is unable to separate the two nice state clusters. Finally, this is a summary of the three dimensionality reduction techniques we talked about today. We need to understand that there's no way to map high dimensional data into low dimensions and preserve the whole structure at the same time. We should choose the method based on the application. For example, if this is for visualization, we can use TSNE for UMAP. If this is for denoising the data before making other models, we can use PCA or other feature selection methods. And uh, as a data scientist, uh, we can always try uh, several methods and see which is the best one for our application. And uh, don't forget, uh, we can also combine methods. For example, use PCA to extract uh, the most interesting signal and reduce dimensionality, but not to three only. And next, uh, we can use uh, the principal components to do TSNE or UMAP. And uh, that's it for today. Thank you.